be the first speaker. Uh, <laughs> uh, I won't introduce myself. Uh, if you're here, you probably figured out figured that out. So. Okay, so let me check a couple of things before we start. First of all, is the microphone working for the recording? Second, is this dark enough a marker? No. Not quite. All right, well, I, have, I have better options. Retire this one. Is this better? Okay, so if, if this starts failing, please let me know. Um, the other thing I should do to start with is, uh, well, I don't get the privilege of thanking the, the session organizer, but I would like to thank the organizers of the overall meeting, and I would recommend that you, if you find an organizer, please take an opportunity to thank them in person for all the hard work they've done putting this meeting together, most of which you, you, won't, be, you won't see, uh, but trust me, it was a lot. So uh, they did a fantastic job, I think, um, and also the AMS staff for their help. Um, okay, now on to the content. So this is, is I guess, uh, one in a series of two talks in this session uh, about joint, joint project with Rochuan, who's here. Um, so he'll give the other one later in the week. Uh, it's based on a series of papers of which there's one that's available. So, so this paper just appeared in Asterisk. Uh, there are also a couple of sequels in progress, which I'll allude to. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's sort of the source material. Uh, there's a there's a there's an uh, elaborate uh, intertwine between what's going on here and what Peter was talking about in his lectures and what he will talk about next time. Uh, you could sort of the introduction of this paper tells you a little more about that. Um, but let me start with. Uh, before I sort of really explain where I'm trying to go, let me start with one sort of classic statement that uh, was sort of already alluded to in Peter's talk uh, that will sort of set the stage for what I'm trying to do. So I'll put that in the middle there. So let F be a perfect field of characteristic P. So throughout this talk, P will always be some fixed prime number. And so consider the following category. So I'm going to look at representations of the absolute Galois group of F. So that has a topology as a profinite group. So I can talk about continuous representations of it if I uh, go to a target with some topology. And in particular, if the target is a finitely generated ZP module, then the, the, uh, the group of automorphisms of that has a topology. So I'm going to take continuous maps from GF into automorphisms and groups of such things. Uh, but now I'm going to view this as a, right, I can tensor these things so it's, it, has a, it has a structure of a tensor category or something like this. Uh, and the statement which I think goes back to cats, although maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, is that this category is equivalent to finitely generated uh, WF modules. So w is a, WF denotes the ring of VIT vectors. So F is a perfect field. It lifts uh, uniquely to a complete DVR with maximal ideal generated by P and residue field F. Uh, so finitely, finitely generated modules of, of that ring. Um, so if, say, D is a typical object in this, uh, of this sort, I want to equip it with an isomorphism with its pullback by phi, where so phi is called Frobenius. And what that means is, well, for example, if you remember that this is a functorial construction, then F has a Frobenius map to itself, and so it's the functorial lift. Um, if you remember more about vid vectors, uh, 
well, you should, th you should think about that, and I'll come back to that later in the talk, but uh, it's the functorial lift of Frobenius on this thing. Um, and what are the two functors going back and forth? So if I have a v over here, then the associated object d of v is a tensor over zp with w of f bar. So f is perfect, so f's inseparable closure is the algebraic closure. Uh, and then I take the gf invariance, where gf acts on this side as I specified, and it acts on this side you know, by functoriality. So you take this diagonal action. And if you want to go the other way, if you start with one of these things, the way you get a Galois representation back is you tensor over w of f with w of f bar, and then you take the phi invariance. So, and in particular, if you do this with FP vector spaces, this uh, this this is an even older statement, which morally is due to Lang, I think. Uh, but I think it, it appears in SGA seven, in the part written by Katz. Okay, so there's actually more to, one can say as well. Um, and this gets back to the, the point that Peter made about k pi ones in his lectures. So under this correspondence, sort of the Galois cohomology of one of these objects is somehow canonically identified with uh, the, the cohomology of this complex. Uh, sorry, D, not M. with phi minus 1 in degrees 0 and 1. And right, the fact that nothing is higher is this, is this k pi 1 property that we saw earlier. OK. So this somehow says that uh, a Galois theoretic construction, representations in the Galois cohomology, uh, somehow is, is related to a, what you might call a coherent cohomology construction. So I'm going to think of this as sort of the Galois, a Galois side, and this, or maybe better to say, a tall side. So this is like an etal topology type of side, and this is like a coherent cohomology type of coherent. So this is sort of the etal side of this correspondence. I'll call this the coherent side. So, so I'm going to talk about various ways to soup this up. So. So I'm going to talk about extensions at various levels of generality. So one thing I want to do is get out of characteristic p. So k is going to generically be a complete uh, non-Archimedean field of mixed characteristics. Um, so it contains qp, I guess I can say. So it's so of course in the mixed characteristic mixed characteristic situation, I don't a priori have Frobenius acting on the base field, so I have to do something else. Uh, but we sort of already know how, what to do based on what Peter said. But I'll reiterate that. So once I've done that, I, I alluded to in that title analytic and other adjective spaces. Well, so I want to replace a k by, say, a rigid analytic space over k. And in the process, we'll see how to deal with some other objects, like perfectoid spaces. Um, and I want to replace zp with qp, which sounds like not a very hard thing to do, but actually there's a subtlety there too, which we'll come back to. Um, and so that, those are sort of the short-term goals. So in the talk, I want to make sure I explain how to actually do these things. But I should also say sort of what the broader goals are. Um, in part by way of making connection with, with Rotron's talk. Um, so the broader goal is that if, I mean, so say x is some rigid space over k. Uh, 
then I want to talk about at all local systems on X, which by which I'll mean, well, I'll be more, I'll try to be more precise about what I mean later. And I want to relate these things to certain kind of algebraic or coherent, but in serious scare quotes because I'm one needs to define something more precise. Um, and really, when I talk about x, there's going to be some funny topology, which was mentioned already this morning. But I'll come back to that. Um, so this kind of correspondence is going to be promoted to some correspondence between some kind of at all sheaves on x and some kind of more coherent looking sheaves. Uh, on a certain topology related to x. And one of the things, there are various reasons why one wants to set up this correspondence, but one of them uh, that's maybe the most relevant for, for Rochon's talk and maybe also for uh, the talks that Peter's been giving is that we would like this kind of construction to be compatible with taking, say, direct, high, uh, direct image and higher direct images. along smooth proper morphisms. And that would sort of provide, essentially, a framework uh, for de describing variants of the comparison isomorphism that, that Peter described uh, today. So this would sort of some sort of comparison isomorphisms with coefficients. See, uh, as in Peter's talk this morning. Well, the, the, right, the, this morning the, the coefficients were, so to speak, constant coefficients. Um, but if you have some framework for this, you can uh, kind of promote. I mean, I'm not going to try to explicitly make the link between uh, this compatibility and, and where comparison isomorphisms come from. Roughly speaking, the point is that. These objects that you get over here sort of retain information about atoll cohomology in some sense, but they also sort of retain some information about other things like Durham cohomology. Um, and so, in some sense, what sort of the, the, the long term idea, which I think is will sort of, this is, will sort of be the principle of Peter's third talk, I think, is that um, what ideally one would like to somehow directly construct sort of phi gamma module cohomology of. Of spaces, um, so I guess so. I think yeah, you're, Peter, you're you're going to say something about this tomorrow uh, on next time, right? In this, in some sense, in some sense. I don't well, let me not promise too much, but anyway. So that's sort of the broader goal. But let me focus on my short-term goals for a while, probably most of the time. OK, so how do I systematically uh, increase the level of generality in this correspondence? So the first thing I want to do is replace a, a field of characteristic p by a field of characteristic 0. Well, there's one case in which that's easy based on what we already know. Um, if k is a perfectoid field, which since I don't think that was defined actually, so let me quickly state the definition. So that means that, so just like for a perfectoid algebra, you have to assume that uh, if you take the, ring, the, the valuation ring of k and you divide by the ideal p, this is a ring of characteristic p, so it has a Frobenius on it. So you want this to be surjective. Um, but this already would hold, for instance, if k is qp, and that's not somehow big enough. So I need some extra condition, for instance, assuming k not discrete would be sufficient. Um, probably even enough to assume k is not absolutely unramified or something like this, but never mind. Um, so if k, is, uh, if k is one of these sort of sufficiently big fields, so for instance, if I take qp, I join all the p power roots of unity, and then take the completion of that, that's sort of the most classical example. but uh, you could also take sort of the Coomer type example um, that sort of showed up implicitly this morning. 
If you take QP and join all P power roots of P, say, and complete that, that would also be one of these things. Okay? So if K is a perfectoid field, then we know from this morning uh, this construction of the tilt, or the, the Fontaine construction, that turns this into some associated field K, which I'll follow Peter and call it K flat. So this will be some complete non-Archimedean field of characteristic P. And it's perfect. And, and we have this isomorphism between the Galois groups of K and K flat. In fact, it's even an equivalence of categories between the finite tall algebras over K and the finite tall algebras over K flat. So this is somehow uh, the, the vast generalization of the fontaine vantin Breger field of norms correspondence that, that came up this morning, um, right, which is sort of included in the almost purity theorem. OK, so this means that if I'm interested in representations of GK, then so if I'm interested in, I hope this is not going to mess up peop people who are taking notes. So, uh, so if K is itself perfectoid, so if K is perfectoid, then GK is the same thing as GK flat. So I can just substitute K flat into the previous theorem. And just read f equals k, f and then you know, read f equals k flat everywhere. Okay. So that's easy. Uh, and Fontaine's original theory of, of phi gamma modules was somehow. I mean, it, it didn't start with this level of generality, but for instance, he had this isomorphism for, say, this example, and you can then just formally. Uh, promote this to a statement about GK when K is not perfectoid by using the fact that if you have a, per, if you have a general K, you can find some algebraic extension of it whose completion is perfectoid. Well, for instance, you could take its algebraic closure, but you don't want to go that far because that would sort of be contentless. You, want to, you can make a relatively small extension, which is, which is perfectoid, and then apply this there. So. So now for general K, find some algebraic extension L over K such that the completion of L is perfectoid, right? Since it'll typically be an infinite extension, so I have to complete. Uh, but that's not going to change the Galois group. GL is the same as GL hat by Krasner's lemma. So now, um, maybe I should actually write this out again. But yeah, so let me not try to just erase and substitute. Let me actually rewrite this. Oh, I apologize. This light is out for some reason. Uh, now, I, the lights are on as high as I can go, so this one is just busted. So. Formally, what happens then is you can describe the continuous representations of GK on, on finitely generated ZP modules as, um, well, the objects, the, the previous objects that I had uh, with K replaced by L, so finitely generated. Uh, w, well, L hat, I should say, flat modules with what I'll just call a, sigma, a, a phi action. So that means this isomorphism. So I'll call this a phi action. Uh, and this whole data, this whole datum has to carry, uh, let's say, let me make this. To make this slightly simpler, let's say this is a Galois extension. A 
plus the action of uh, plus some action of the Galois group of L over k on this whole data, um, where the point is that gal L over k acts on this thing. So this is again going to be some kind of semi semi linear action, but it has to it has to respect the it has to commute with phi, so it's really an action on this whole whole thing. So this is just formally taking this thing and keeping track of the extra information of the action of uh, GK instead of just GL. Okay, and so this is basically this is basically Fontaine's correspondence, except he stated it in a particular case. So Fontaine states this specifically in the case where K is say a finite extension of QP. Well, any piadic any piadic field with perfect residue field would be enough, but let's just say finite extension of QP, and L is K adjoin mu P infinity. Um, but the point is that you get you get this kind of thing for any choice of L. I mean, if, like I said, you could have taken L to be an algebraic closure of K, and then the statement has basically no content. But uh, if you take L pretty small, it has a lot of content. Okay. Um, and Galois cohomology sort of transfers over. So Galois cohomology corresponds to well, you take the you take the complex I had before, um, but then you have to take sort of you have to you start with this and you view these as modules for the action of gal L over K and you take hypercohomology. So Galois cohomology. Okay. Okay, so far so good. Uh, great. Okay, so now let me translate this into the language uh, that will be needed to talk about more general spaces. Uh, and this will sort of drag in the concepts, uh, some of the concepts that we've seen in Peter's lectures so far. So, and I'm going to follow Peter's convention and stick, stick with just using attic spaces to only have one kind of space around. So when I talk about rigid spaces, I'm going to implicitly think of them as, as attic spaces as well. But anyway. So x is the point corresponding to k, and never mind about the second argument, if you don't know what that means. Um, so I'm going to consider not the atal topology on this, but the so-called pro-atal topology, which Peter didn't define, and I don't really want to either. Uh, let me just say uh, that it, it, it's like the atal topology, except you're allowed to form infinite towers of, well, certain infinite towers of atal morphisms. So it's not quite the pro category of the atal site, but it's close. And actually, depending on context, there are slightly different conventions as to what it should be, but I'm going to just completely ignore all of that. OK, so now, already the left side of this correspondence can be re restated in terms of this. So the objects, that, the, the Galois representations I had before, I can think of as, well, these are going to be sort of locally finite ZP underscore modules on X pro et al. So ZP underscore is ZP underscore is what I'll call the constant sheaf associated to ZP. Um, the reason I'm putting that in quotes is because it's not the constant sheaf in the purely sheaf theoretic sense. Um, there's a notion of a constant on this for this pro et al topology. There's a notion of a constant sheaf associated to a topological space, um, which sort of takes into account the topology and the fact that there are inverse limits si hiding in this construction. So roughly speaking, this is the constant sheaf ZP, but that's not quite literally true, but pretend it is. Um, I'm going to commit more egregious 
uh, sins over the course of this talk, and, uh, which is pretty much inevitable when you're trying to sort of compress this much material into about an hour. Uh, and so these, so this is, the, this is just a, another way to describe that category over there. But instead of Galois action, I'm using the sheaf, sort of the sheaf theory of this category. Just like you know, ordinary Galois representations can be described in terms of a tall topology, I'm doing the same sort of thing over here. And these things correspond to locally, maybe let me say finitely presented, although probably finitely generated would be enough. But. Uh, I'll, I'll call, write down another sheaf that I'll call A. So A is sort of the sheaf theoretic version of W L hat flat. So if I think of L as being an object of this site, then the, sort of the evaluation of this thing is W L hat flat. Um, in our paper, I guess we call this A tilde because we're trying to, for some reason, which I'm going to ignore, the non-tilde version won't appear, so I'll just drop the tilde because I'm going to forget it anyway. Um, and the, the passage back and forth is, this, is sort of the same. A sheaf V on this side goes to... Oh, yes, plus V action, sorry. I need the V action. I don't need... What I don't need is a gamma action because... Or the action of gal L over K is incorporated into the sheaf property because these are sheaves on this. So sheaves. Maybe I'll write this once, but I'll forget to say sheaves of from now on. The fact that this, is a, this object is a sheaf on here includes the fact that it has some kind of gal L over K action. Um, so, but I do need the phi. We'll see the phi in a moment. So to go from here to here, you just extend scalars. You don't need to take any invariance because, again, that, I'm just leaving that to be accounted for by the sheaf property. And to go the other way, again, I don't need to uh, sort of extend scalars to an algebraic closure because that's, again, sort of subsumed in the sheaf property. I just take the invariant. So this is, this is literally the same statement. I've just coded it in some categorical language. But uh, this has the advantage of being the, the thing that translates directly to more general spaces. Now, comments, uh, in addition to what I said already. Okay. Now it's time for this to go. So I sort of said that there are, there are no invariants because uh, I hid that in the sheaf property. But there is a little bit of content that, 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 that is missing if I say that. Let me put this over here first. So right, that, so there is no, right, so no Galois actions. These are subsumed by the sheaf axiom. But there's an important point about, there's an important difference between this side and this side, because this doesn't look like this is actually a more workable construction than this thing, whereas we know that this looks much, this looks much more reasonable, especially if this Galois group is reasonably small. And the reason is because, right, the, the, I, I remember I called this side the atal side and this side the coherent side. This coherent side has a property that's reminiscent of coherent sheaves, which is that I can determine them by, right, coherent sheaves can be determined on affine subspaces. And this thing has the property that sort of the, an object of the right-hand side uh, can be determined by its evaluation on any L over K such that L hat is perfectoid. For instance, any strictly arithmetically profinite extension. So these, the, these extensions, these, so to speak, perfectoid extensions of K play the role of affine neighborhoods uh, in this topology. Um, 
and well, well, when I say determined by, I mean in the sense that you sort of evaluate and you get the underlying object, and then you have to remember some descent data plus descent data to k. Because that's the sheaf property forces you to, it gives you this, and you have to remember it. But you can go the other way as well. If you start with, say, that, then that's, you, you don't have to specify this object on all such L. Once you specify it on one and give that go action, it propagates over the whole topology. So um, this is basically because of some sort of acyclicity property of the sort that came up earlier. But. OK, so now with this language, I can fairly directly promote this to uh, rigid spaces. So for x a rigid space over k, but viewed as an attic space, there's a functor to sort of take a classical rigid space and addify it, or attic addicify it. Um, you get the same, you get a similar, well, you get the same conclusion. So the same statement without changing any of the symbols works uh, in, that, in that setting. Um, and it, but it comes down, but the fact that this has any use, use comes down to the fact that that this thing contains enough what I call perfectoid subdomains. So these are the analog of having, finding the perfectoid fields, you know, perfectoid algebraic extensions of k. So for, a tip, for, so for example, if, if x is the attic spectrum of, an, of a classical affinoid algebra, with, again, never mind about this, um, you can find some finite at all tower, so you can find some sequence of finite tall morphisms like so, um, well, surjective on, spe on spectra of finite tall morphisms, um, in such a way that this inverse, uh, sorry, this direct limit of these rings uh, is a perfectoid algebra, uh, say over, so if you want it, it can be over a perfectoid field, um, although you can define a perfectoid algebra without that, but you might as well, if you want, you can just start by taking some algebraic extension of K, which is perfectoid, and then, you know, for instance, yeah, you can take some roots of some units in here. And fine. Okay. And then again, uh, these modules are determined by their evaluations to those guys. Um, yes, they're determined by the evaluations of those guys. So again, you can concretely realize the correspondence by picking one of these towers and then evaluating, and you get a statement of that flavor on the right-hand board. But uh, in the, at this level of generality, there's not nearly a distinguished such choice, because typically you would have to make some choice of coordinates or something. And so really, the more canonical thing is to consider all possible choices, which is what this formulation does. So, so sorry, how do you that's the meaning of taking enough Well, this is the meaning of what a perfectoid, this is, no, so this is an example of a perfectoid subdomain. A perfectoid, I mean, I didn't say the depth, I mean, these things can contain certain towers over x. And so roughly speaking, what you do is you take one of those towers, you take sort of the inverse limit on spaces, which corresponds to some sort of direct limit on rings, and you want that to be a perfectoid, right. um, perfectoid right. ring. Well, perfect, yeah, enough means that they, that, you know, they, they form a basis for the topology. Yeah, yeah, locally, this topology looks like this out of affinoid perfectoid. And on an affinoid perfectoid, these things actually correspond to modules. So this category, that's what I mean by this side being the coherent side of the correspondence, is that on affinoid perfectoids, this, these are actually realized by modules. OK. Now, what about, so I've sort of done two of the things that I said I would do. I've done this. That was easy. I did this. That, took this reformulation. 
Um, and now I need to do this. Now, why is this not completely straightforward? You might think about if you go from uh, ZP representations of a Galois group to QP representations of a Galois group, that's not such a big leap because if you think about representations of GK, say continuous ones, on finite dimensional QP vector spaces, they, have, they always have GK stable lattices. And this is somehow because GK is a compact group. It's profinite. Yeah? But the analog, so if, at least if x is connected, then the analog of GK, so these things, these things are representations for a certain fundamental group. Uh, So there is a notion of an atel fundamental group of origin analytic space, uh, introduced by de Jong, and it is, in general, not compact. And so we, we, one example has already been presented. The hop surface would give you an example. Or if you want one dimension lower, a Tate uniform has elliptic curve. You take GM going to gm modulo q to the z for some q less than 1. So this is a Tate elliptic curve. And so this is a, this is, so to speak, an atoll covering space map with deck transformations by the group, by the discrete group z. So this is a z cover. And so that's not compact. So that's sort of a prototypical example of, you know, covers of topological spaces which you know, don't come from, you know, which sort of don't come from profinite things. And this was, in some sense, the point of, of region analytic spaces was to make this, make it possible to write this down. So, and there are lots of interesting, there are many more interesting examples that come from things like Rappaport, Zinc, period morphisms, and so on. Um, but this is the, the most basic example to keep in mind. And so that means that uh, you can't simply invert P on both sides of this correspondence um, and get what you want because that will somehow these things only, I mean, if you, if you just take the isogenic category of this, that doesn't give you all the, the representation, that doesn't give you all the, uh, the locally finite Z, uh, QP vector spaces. Uh, so for that and a couple of other reasons, you have to replace the sheaf A with something slightly different. So, so I'm going to sort of very quickly breeze through the fact that you change the sheaf. Okay, so let me sort of just sort of cartoon this in a couple of a couple of steps. Okay, so this step I can drop explicitly. So I'm going to associate a new sheaf B on the Proital site, which is just you know, A with P inverted. So just invert P everywhere. Um, now this, this, is, this turns out to be sort of too, bi too big for what I want. Uh, so I replace this by something called B dagger. Um, and then I sort of complete, this is some sort of completion to get a sheaf that I'll call C. Now, rather than try to formally define these, let me give you an analogy, which is maybe more helpful than the actual definition. And the analogy comes from this case. So when Fontaine did the, these, this original construction, he didn't quite use vit rings. Um, so the analog of A in Fontaine's original story was well, let's say k equals qp. Uh, you take a ring of formal power series and some variable t, and then you take the p-adic completion of that. So that's, that's a complete discrete valuation ring with maximal ideal p, but its residue field is not perfect. It's a power series field. OK. So b, of course, corresponds to this thing with p inverted. Now, these, these, ser these formal Laurent series have the property that you can't evaluate them anywhere. Because all I, all I did was insist that in the negative direction, the coefficients, right, these things formally look like 
double sums with p adic coefficients. But if you pick some element of some extension of QP uh, in the negative direction, so maybe you, make it, you, maybe you try making it of norm less than 1, so the positive direction is OK, because these things are all p adically integral. But in the negative direction, I have no control over how, how slowly these tend to 0. So, so what you really want um, to do sort of more analytic things is to look at the subring of this, uh, of this, this is actually now a field, where the series actually converge in some range of the form absolute value of t less than 1 and greater than something. You don't fix the something. Um, basically because that, that you need that you need to not fix it to get an action of Frobenius. Um, but of course these things still have the property that their coefficients are p-adically bounded. So, so here the c is sort of the thing you, t you get from this thing by dropping the restriction of bounded coefficients. So you actually take the collection of all series with qp coefficients that converge in some region like this. This is sometimes called the robo ring because it came from Robo's work on p-adic differential equations. So you can do a similar process with vit vectors, which I won't try to, to define explicitly. It has to do with the, right, the, the, the field L flat, say, in, or the, well, the, the tilt in general has some kind of norm. And you can use it to define, uh, right? If you think of vit vectors, if you know what vit vectors are, you know they can be described in terms of sums of Teichmuller components. And you put some growth conditions on those, uh, analogous to growth conditions that impose convergence in this sense. And then C is some kind of Frechet completion of that. To be more precise and less, less dishonest would take way more time than I have, so I'm not going to try to do that. And now, um, maybe I'll do this over here. Now I can state the analog of that, that theorem. So I should be calling these things theorems. This is also a theorem. So the category of sheaves of locally finite free QP modules, QP underscore modules, on X pro et al. So these are what I would like to call, think of as a tall but really they're pro et al, QP local systems. So you could, if x is connected, you can identify with certain representations of this et al fundamental group. And this turns out to be equivalent to the category of um, locally finite free, finite free or finite projective, it doesn't really matter, C, mo C modules on x pro et al with phi action. Uh, yes. So, so, there's a slo so as Jay pointed out, there's a slope condition. And what the slope condition means locally, these things descend to uh, a dagger, which I didn't write down. But a dagger is the intersection of a with b dagger. So it's not all of these things, which is an important point that I'll come back to in a moment, um, but you pick out some of them. So the fact that you're picking out some of them, this is, this is a little bit like picking out semi-stable vector bundles among all vector bundles in a, in a certain formal sense. And in fact, uh, say, for instance, when x is a point, this is not merely an analogy. There literally is a, a, a one-dimensional, a curve, a one-dimensional Noetherian scheme for which this category, this category is equivalent to vector bundles on that. And these guys are the semi-stable ones. So this was uh, uh, an incredible observation of Farg and Fontaine, which I think Laurent is not going to say much about, at least not explicitly. It'll, it'll be implicit in his talk. Uh, so you've been warned that, when, at least in the case of a point, these things behave like vector bundles. Uh, on some space. Actually, even in this level of generality, they behave like vector bundles on some space. And this is some kind of 
semi-stable condition on fibers of some fibration. But where is the fundamental, where is it? Um, well, it's in the fact that this condition is a local condition. So it's in the fact that, that you don't globally, even on an affinoid, you don't get global descents. Um, so that's, that's, that's where the fact that the fundamental group is not compact is, is, is sitting in this picture. Um, in, in a more technical sense, it has to do with the fact that these, there are, you can't really, if you try, you, could, you, you can't really glue modules over this ring. So yeah, maybe this is a point I should mention. This, ri this ring of sheaves C satisfies sort of Tate and Keel style type uh, sort of acyclic and gluing properties. So you could sort of glue, you could, you could, could so uh, this, is, this includes the fact that again, on an affinoid perfectoid, these things come, these things are just given by evaluation. So the modules actually correspond to the sheaves. Um, and there's a fact that you can glue over some cover, which is not true of something like B or B dagger. So that's somehow one of the reasons you have to go to C. Of course, even before this relative story came along, this, this RoboRing passage uh, was known because it's useful for many other reasons. For instance, um, if you want to write down uh, the various Fontaine functors uh, on Galois representations, like the crystalline functor and the, the Durham functor, uh, they don't naturally uh, apply to phi gamma modules in this sort of over this kind of ring, um, but they do apply very naturally in this setting, uh, as originally observed by Berger. And uh, well, maybe he, yeah. Let's just say it that that way. So even in classical piatic Hodge theory, you already needed this suite of rings. But I want to emphasize in this relative story, there's another reason why you need this, why you need to sort of replace the original sheaf A, which is sort of reasonable, vit vectors with this slightly more mysterious thing, it's because the gluing doesn't really work and but it, otherwise. And it's related to the fact that the tall fundamental groups are not compact. OK. OK, so I have about two or three minutes. So let me make one other comment. Uh, So we've just discussed the fact that not all of the, the objects on the right-hand side would be at all unless I put that extra hypothesis in. So the C, the C modules on the locally, the vector bundles, sort of the C vector bundles on X pro et al, uh, with phi action form this very natural sort of homological category. But it's only an exact category because I'm insisting on uh, you know, this, finite, this locally free condition. So if you want to do more homological algebra, it would be useful to have some kind of abelian closure of it, so where you can have sort of coherent type objects. Um, so I'm going to sort of roughly state a theorem that if you consider what are called pseudo coherent, so the problem with stating a theorem like this is that. Uh, as, as Peter pointed out this morning, perfect and perfectoid things are very far from being Noetherian. So you have to be very careful about finite generation properties. Um, so, so on one hand, it's sort of convenient uh, to talk about what are called pseudo-coherent modules. So pseudo a pseudo-coherent module over a ring is one that admits a projective resolution by finite free modules, but possibly infinitely many of them. This is not the same thing as finite projective dimension unless you happen to have a regular ring. Right? Uh, so if you have an irregular but Noetherian ring, you can have a projective resolution. I mean, uh, every finitely generated module has this property, but most of them don't have finite projective resolutions. So which uh, by where, here, if I put projective here, yes. That would be the same. Yep. So we, yeah. 
So I want uh, sort of mo module, sheaves of modules that locally come from one of these things. Um, and so uh, these things generally don't form, I mean, for some crazy non Noetherian ring, pseudo coherent modules don't generally form um, an abelian category. Right, they only form, they only have this sort of two out of three property that if you have three terms in the exact sequence, two of them have this property and the third one does. But kernels and co-kernels generally don't, don't make sense. Um, but if you look at these guys with phi actions, then they actually form an abelian category. Um, and roughly the, the, the basic idea, which I think maybe will, will show up less implicitly in Rotron's talk, is that when x is smooth, these can be described uh, using certain Noetherian rings. And you should, you should have in mind, for instance, as in classical piatic Hodge theory, classical meaning over a point, right? In, in, in classical piatic Hodge theory, you don't use these Witt vectors. You use like these rings of power series, which have better Noetherian properties. Um, and this was partially generalized, sort of, it was generalized sort of to the context of Faulting's work by Andrade and Bruneau, and this, is, this involves some generalization of that further. So when X is smooth, you can really capture this category in terms of certain modules of certain Noetherian rings. And then this category, this is automatic, and the ascending chain condition also happens to work. Um, and in the general case, you have to do some kind of resolution of singularities argument using the fact that we know resolution of singularities for rigid spaces. Um, it's it's kind of complicated, but something like this works. So this is in fact, so there is, I, and all right, last comment. Um, I'm not claiming this is the abelian completion. I'm not complaining. The, I'm not claiming that these things, for instance, can be resolved by uh, locally free C modules on X pro et al with the fee action. So I don't even know that for a point, uh, which is a little bit embarrassing. Um, but this is an abelian category in which you can work. And so this, you could really kind of try to do uh, computations with this. And uh, we'll see some sort of example of this in Rochon's talk. So I'll stop there. <laughs>